Father, when you came, you came with something that transformed everything and anyone that came into connection with you. And we pray that your word, as it comes into our moment in this morning, that you would give us something from your heart. We thank you that we don't have to perform, and we don't have to entertain, that we are here to discover, we are here to embrace you. And we thank you that you use the very gifts that we represent to enable those things to happen. And so our prayer, Father, is that you would open up our minds and our hearts to do all that you want to do, and that nothing you intended to do would be undone. But we recognise that in order for that to be a reality, we need to make ground for you. And I pray if there's anything in us that is really distracting us, or anything in us that's saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, pray that we would have the capacity in our minds and our hearts to say no, be still, sit, wait. And I pray that there will be a sense of, um, okay, what's God going to say? Amen. (coughs) Amen. So um, let me just read you one, one verse. Uh, it's 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. He was talking about David's brothers. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, and it's these words, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. And I said to um, Ma- um, Michael yeah, last week, I said, I saw him in the week, and he said, I don't know whether I'm a preacher or not. I said, you're a heart speaker. You speak to the heart. I said, you open up people's hearts. And some people speak to the mind. And some people speak to the heart. I think when Jesus communicated, he spoke to the heart that affected the mind, not the mind that affected the heart. Mm -hmm. And so my title for this morning, if I have one, and it came from an old preacher called Andrew Murray. And the word that, It's actually the book, and it's called Absolute Surrender. And he was a a missionary, writer, Christian evangelist, passionate man of God. And he said this, Absolute Surrender. And that word, Absolute Surrender, means to totally dedicate your life to God. To totally surrender your life to God. You know, we used to say in the 80s, Unless he's Lord of all, he can't be Lord at all. Jesus wants to be Lord of our lives. And that means absolute surrender. You see, because God can't bless that part of you, that remains you. God can't bless that part of you, that remains you. God's plan is to get the you out of you. And then God can bless the him in you. Because God wants to bless Jesus in you. So the objective of God's journey from when we first get saved to when we depart, is to get as much as Jesus in us and to get as much as us out of us. As much as you out of you, as much as me 
out of me. That's God's objective. And the reason for that is because he wants to prepare us for a holy heaven. So until, <coughs> until it's absolute surrender to him, there are going to be contentions. <coughs> God doesn't contend with himself. He contends with us. Jacob, Paul, Peter. It's the... Me in me that God contends with. God doesn't contend with himself. Galatians 5 talks about the, the, the struggle with the, the flesh and the spirit. God is wanting to get the flesh out of us. Israel went through the desert to get Egypt out of them because they were being prepared for a promised land. So when God picked David, he picked David amongst his brothers <coughs> through investigation because he was out there looking after the, 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 the field and the, the sheep and stuff. <coughs> we know those words, God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. And so the question that we have to ask is, when we say God is looking at the heart, what we're saying is, what, what is God looking for? I mean, he's not looking for that pumping thing, is he? God is looking for something in the heart. So Ephesians 4.29 says this, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. God is looking to see what is in our hearts. He says in Luke 6.45, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil for the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. On Friday, we had a Bible study. We had some really good Bible studies. Uh, we're looking at Isaiah. <coughs> I mean, we go deep. Uh, we talk about using pick and hammer to extract the word. But on, on Friday, we were there with Kango. We were kangoing. We were going deep. Because you can go. <coughs> and as we dug deep, so we discovered and we are challenged by questions. And one of the declarations that came out during the conversations that we had with one another was this. <coughs> about the Reformation. And we asked the question... Did the Reformation go far enough? And I said, no, it didn't. You see, the Reformation came into an atmosphere where Catholicism was being the, the driving force behind the whole process. And it was about trying to work and earn our way to salvation. And the Reformation brought justification by faith, by grace. So it brought salvation by grace, but where it fell short was, it said, it held on to sanctification by law, meaning change by law, meaning <clears throat> you do the changing in you. So when God wants to get the you out of you, what the Reformation is saying is that you get the you out of you. See, we come to Jesus, the Reformation, we come to Jesus by grace, faith in what Jesus did, but the sanctification aspect of the Reformation, the change, that's what sanctification is, it's you that gets you out of you through 
surrender and submission to the law through buffeting your body and making it subjection to the will and purposes of God. That's what the Reformation is held on to. It said you get clean through hard resisting. And it never stepped into the atmosphere where the reality of the sanctification change, getting you out of you, it never stepped into that grace aspect of that. You see, it's salvation by grace, it's sanctification by grace. Change comes about not because you work hard to overcome your inner you. Change comes about by grace. The idea is, I do this so God does that. It's not how it works. God does this so we become that. It's all about God doing something. But that aspect of the Reformation didn't really and hasn't really come home to the Christian heart yet. There's no change in the life until there's absolute surrender. Self-justification gets in the way of grace. But the truth is, it's salvation and sanctification by grace. We have to receive freely from God or we can't receive at all. Freely you gave it all for us. Surrendered your life. We sing the songs. We declare the word. We exhort the praise. And then we live in the failure. But we have to receive freely from God or we can't receive at all. If we make a contribution, we get in the way of God. And that applies to everything of the kingdom. It's always about God. And what God does. So, are you an earnest Christian was an old declaration that we used to make back in Sarah's day. Are you an earnest Christian? Or are you a nominal Christian? See, an earnest Christian was a Christian that worked hard to achieve the victory over the flesh. And a nominal Christian was perceived to be someone who maybe they had a go at working hard at overcoming the flesh, but weren't very good at it. And so they limped. And they limped most of the way. And they can't let go because they've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, but they can't overcome the flesh because they don't have within them the same kind of wear with it all to overcome the flesh like the earnest Christian does. Now the earnest Christian is a law-abiding Christian, very successful. They know how to get up at 6.30 in the morning and get to their Bible and pray and they're disciplined and they come to church on time and they give their tithe and they just serve everywhere and they do everything and they're always active, the earnest Christian. But what we don't see about the earnest Christian is that they are doing it for a reason. To make themselves feel better. And as soon as we do it for that reason, we are outside of freedom, outside of grace. And therefore we get in God's way. But the nominal Christian, he 
he has a go, he, 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 the alarm goes off at half six, but, you know, he thinks it's part of the dream. <laughs> you know, and he sees the Bible on the table, on the shelf, and missed all of the videos and the DVDs and Star Wars and things. But he just doesn't go to it, doesn't pick it up. And he knows he should be on church in time, but, you know, he just can't seem to manage that. And, and he knows he's got to be giving because otherwise, you know, Paul don't get fed and, you know, and, and, and the, but he can't be bothered. His, his need is too great somewhere else. And he knows that other people need support and help, and, but, that, you know, he's got, he's got a busy life. Life is too, you know, everything is happening for them. You know, it's, don't they understand at church that I've got so many things going on? And they just struggle and then they feel guilty. Are you an earnest Christian or a nominal Christian? When you look at your life now having journeyed for a while with Jesus, have you seen changes? Have there been changes in you? The test. I used to hate tests at school. I always got them wrong. And they always picked me to say my answers that were always wrong. They chose me to do all the spellings and I never got any right. I lived, I lived in school in fear for the next intimidation. Now, if you don't know intimidation, you don't, you don't understand. But to be humiliated again and again The test. This isn't to humiliate you. This is to ask your heart something. What is in your heart? Do you know? Well, here's the test. Jesus said, what comes out of your mouth is in your heart. What comes out of your mouth is in your heart. So let me just read a few scriptures for you, just to entertain you. I won't give you the references, but if you want them, you can have them afterwards. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man, Jesus says, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this is what defiles the man. But the things that proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart. And those defile the man, ye brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of what the heart is full of. For out of the heart come evil thought, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. After looking around at them, anger grieved at their hardness of heart, Jesus says. These people, they honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful, more deceitful than all else, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I never knew you, Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast demons out in your name, done wonders and miracles in your name? And then I will declare, Jesus says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What's coming out of your mouth is what's in your heart. I'd finished preparing this. I was on my way to church and the man wanted to go into the petrol garage. So I gracefully let him in. He was sitting there with a very posh car and I wanted to humble myself 
with my little car and bow down to his superiority. So I sat there patiently, flashed him, and waited for him to turn into the petrol garage. Because, after all, I was just preparing a sermon about being generous. And so I sat there, and for some reason this guy thought it was, I think he might have thought he had to park there or something, because he wouldn't move. And I waited two or three minutes. And then before, it was probably 30 seconds, but it felt like two or three minutes. And I found myself saying something not inappropriate. <laughs> and then the Lord said to me, what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And so the reality of our lives tell the truth by what we say. And I said, Lord, I'm still under construction. <laughs> you know, I need to get me out of me and more of him in me. You see, death and life is in the tongue. Death and life is in the tongue. What we say either brings life or death to ourselves or to others. If you go around all day long, as I used to, saying, you idiot, you're an idiot, Paul, you're an idiot. I mean, it's not surprising I ended up being one, you know. <laughs> teasing, teasing. But the, but the fact is, that if you believe things, if you say things, if you put yourself down all the time, don't be surprised that you start developing the characteristics of those types of people. The tongue has the power to build and to destroy. And if you go around telling people and speaking in inappropriate ways to people, don't be surprised that all around you is devastation, breakdown, broken relationships. But don't think that you can somehow all of a sudden present something really wonderful when your heart is not right. Because if you just present something, but inside, like I did this morning, it will tell the truth. It will come out in some other way. And so what God is wanting to do is to refine us and purify us so that we truly are him in us, not me in me. And the tongue determines, and it's, a, it's an indication of what's going on inside of us. Is your heart, brothers and sisters, right with God today? Now, I can ask you that, and you can look angelic, as you all do, because you're all so beautiful. And you look so holy, and so pure and righteous. And I'm the only sinner here. Well, apart from Richard. But, um... <laughs> And, I, and we can seem like we're all okay. But God knows. Is your heart right with God? Brothers and sisters, if it isn't, if it isn't, then let him make it right. And I say that, let him make it right. Freely you have received. Let grace transform form your driven nature and let grace equip your broken nature. Let him make your heart right. So how does he do that? Simply, simply two words. The first thing we have to do if God is going to get involved in the genuine change of who we are, simply, well, that's it, it's three words. First word, film. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute surrender is the beginning. Stop deceiving yourself. Stop deceiving others. Come to God. No noise and clang and cymbal. No big shouts and big declarations. Just get before God and say to God, Father, I absolutely surrender to you. I absolutely.
absolutely surrender. So that's the beginning. Don't no longer trust yourself. And the second is trust God. Trust, there's a few words on there, but anyway, I'll say the word very good at maths. But trust God. Trust God. Stop trusting yourself. Why should you not trust yourself? Well, some of the reasons I already said in those verses that I've read already. That we are corrupt. <coughs> Inside our hearts, we are, there is no good thing in us. What isn't of God isn't worth keeping. Have you ever gone to the fridge and found that you had cheese worth three weeks, three weeks out of date and milk, you know, that's sort of changing its perspective on life? <laughs> and uh, you know tomatoes and, and beans, tins of beans that you only could have, you, you had half a tin of beans so you put the other half in the thing and then you just grew like little flowers out of it you know, <laughs> you know? have you ever been to the fridge where every now and again you have to go to the fridge and just <coughs> you never eat in my ass again will you? <laughs> <laughs> but you go to the fridge and you just have to clear it Debbie does it, she clears all the stuff that needs to be thrown away that it's out of date, out and God wants to clean us up and clean us out. And anything of us isn't any good. Let's, look, let's, let's look, be, be, be under no illusions. If anything in us could save us, God would have used it. But he didn't, because he couldn't. Because there was nothing good in us. By what Old Testament says, even our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. And the, 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 the true description of that is a woman's tampon. That's the best we can offer God. A woman's tampon. There's nothing good in us. Nothing. And let's be under no illusions. Which is why we have to absolutely surrender and trust him to do the stuff that needs to be changed. Not through our best effort, but by surrendering. Not through guilt and shame, but trust in him. You see, we should trust him and not ourselves because as human beings, we are egocentric. And I think this means, my terminology, we're full of ourselves. And just another concept, meism. We never think pure, even when we think pure, until we think with the purity of God. Even the kindness that we offer is so often contaminated with intent and motive. Even the good that we want to do is filled with some inappropriateness, some anger on our part. You see, I've lived with myself now for 59 years and I've kind of discovered who I am. And I'm not the worst person in the world. I mean, and the reality is that none of us are any good. The only one that's any good is God. So once we come to conclusion there, we can then build with God. But if we keep on relying on ourselves and thinking that we can give God a hand or just, you know, contribute something, we will never change. We will never grow. We will always just go round in circles, either beating ourselves up or trying too hard and not achieving. We need to be full of him. And being full of him is being full of love. Being full of love. So when I speak out those, well, let the man go, and then I say negatively uh, something critical. Not, I didn't swear anyone like that. I don't swear. But just something negative that was just detrimental, that if he heard, he wouldn't be very happy. <coughs> That's not love. Love is kind and patient, you know, Corinthians 13. You see, because our hearts are in poor shape. Jesus says, Matthew, our hearts are five, far from us. The heart is full of things. And when the heart is full of things of this world, 
there's little time for God. When our hearts are filled with things of this world, there's little time for God. And we are easily distracted. But Matthew 12, 35, a good man from his heart produces good things. What kind of heart does God want us to have? Recently, I gained a perspective and I said these words, the currency of heaven, the currency of heaven is kindness, compassion, mercy and love. The Christian should trade with these qualities. In everything we do, in everything we are, in everything we say, and everywhere we go, we need to trade with this, these currencies. Compassion, kindness, mercy and love. And if what we do doesn't contain and is not motivated by those things, then we need to really examine where it's coming from and ask God to forgive us and surrender, absolute surrender, and seek his grace to be able to have the right kind of heart for that moment. He wants us to have a heart full of him. Jesus tells a story in Luke 7, I won't read it, but it basically says this. The woman came to <coughs> Simon's house. Simon's sitting there with his pomp and his religiosity, his capabilities, his, his self-righteousness. The woman who's, um, you know, a woman of the night comes in and washes his feet with tears, hair dry, you know the story. <coughs> and Simon and the guests say, if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she was. And they are detrimental to him. So he tells them, Jesus tells them a story. And he tells them about two servants who, uh, who owed much. And he says, which one of them, but this is a challenge of the question, which one of them loved him more? And Simon reluctantly said, I guess the one who was forgiven more. Forgiven more. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. You see, unless you know that God has forgiven you, absolutely forgiven you, not because you were not that bad a person, but because you absolutely needed to be forgiven, that there's no good thing in you, and that the righteousness of God wants to invade your life. Unless you know that it's only God who does it, you will never really truly be grateful to God. You will always have an element of self-righteousness about you. A sense of, well, I am bad, but I'm not as bad as them. No, we are all bad. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as soon as we elevate ourselves with some self-righteousness, we begin to judge people. And as soon as we judge people, we begin to move away from people. But what God wants us to do is to realise that we are no good, but he's making us good. And his goodness in us draws us to people so that we love the broken and the lonely and the outcast and the widow and the poor and the vulnerable and the needy. And we get alongside the, the vagrant and the, the, the street drunk and we, 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 we love them, we, the, the mentally inappropriate. We, we, we draw near to them. And we're not doing it so that we can be seen to be doing it as people who are doing a good job. Like Debbie's sister said to Debbie yesterday, you should be nominated for an Oscar or one of those things where he got, um, the OBE thing. You know, and she said, well, I want to see the Queen. And then and Leslie said, well, then, then you, someone should nominate you because you're such a good person. Yeah, Debbie is a good person. But the reality is anything good in Debbie is only because God has done it. You know, and anything good in you is only because God has done it. We can't take any credit. At the end of the age, we're going to throw our crowns before him. I don't want any of God's glory because I don't deserve any of God's glory. You know, people often commend me, but I, I'm just a sinner. I'm a wretch that was saved by grace and every day I'm being saved by grace. 
And that's the message of hope that's in the gospel for the world today. It's not something we can contribute to. It's something that God has made possible because of what his son Jesus Christ did 2,000 or so years ago. Trust God. Thanks, Rich. Well, thank you that uh, your grace uh, abounds and flows around us uh, at, and stays in us. Uh, Father, thank you that that unrevealed kindness from you uh, is something that can carry us uh, and bring forgiveness and help us to shine light in other people's lives. I pray that you'll go with us this week uh, to bring your glory to us.